Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 43, Return to Vasselheim. As the episode opens, the cast discusses a few people they want to talk to in Vasselheim, including some names they did not mention at the end of the last episode, like Lady Kima. Percy. Yes? Can I just remind you, for no other reason than to be helpful to you in the game, and no other reason, that the black powder salesman lives here. So I'm just, <laughs> just throwing it out there. You might need some it's, supplies. It's, it's interesting because I sleep at night and these voices from nowhere consistently remind me that there's a black powder motion what? in what this. What game are you talking about? Though? As they discuss potentially buying potions, they remember that Grog once bought a strength potion from a vendor here. And Vex definitely wants to give that vendor a piece of her mind. And then Vanessa returns from her hunt, accompanied by Zara and Cash, played by their original players, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn and Will Friedle. Cash Hi. Off. How are you? Uh, it's cash what, uh, uh, what are you doing here? This is kind of where I live. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> cash, is that? Is, this is this her, is the, Z. Is no? that what? This is the guy. Oh. I recognize you. you Wait do? a second. I won 75 gold pieces at the Crucible when I bet on Kern the Hammer. You did! Hey. That was money well spent, oh, my friend. Yeah. Thank you for that night, by the way. You're very welcome. It's fun to see each half of the party meeting the most beloved guest stars that the other half of the group went on an adventure with. Hopefully that sentence made sense outside of my head. But this moment, where Cash references Grog's first fight with Kern the Hammer, is such a fantastic moment because it helps sell the idea that Cash was in this city, which we know he was because that fight happened just before his adventure with the group. And this is a super easy thing to do in your own games when you happen to have a guest star. You can just take somebody aside and tell them something that they might know about or have experienced about the other party members, if there's something like this that applies. I'm not sure if Matt did that for Will Friedle, or if Will had just happened to watch episode 17 in the lead up to his own appearance on the show. And we know that Mary Elizabeth McGlynn watches every episode, she's just a fan. But in your games, you likely don't have the opportunity for guest players to watch along with your campaign, so my recommendation would be to just give them a little bit of info they might know about the party and their exploits if there is anything they reasonably would have heard about. Now that Zara and Cash are here, the party launches into an explanation of what has happened in Amon and the rest of Tal'Dorei. What color? Kind of? How many? How many? Eight of them. Chroma <laughs> There were eight of them. Yeah, there was eight. There's four of them. <laughs> just one dragon. One, three, five, eight. Eight of them. Well, yeah, right, no, he's right. Wow. He's right. Vanessa says this is beyond anything the guild can handle. I think that surprises the party, probably because they assume that every member of the Slayer's Take is a badass fighter. And canonically, they are, but based on the player's experience, no pun intended, they probably expect every Slayer's Take member to be an adventurer of around the same level as Vox Machina. But that might not be the case. I mean, it does tend to be more true of Matt's NPCs than it would be at some other tables, but this is a tricky situation. At a certain point, there has to be a level cap for the NPC members of the Slayer's Take, otherwise they could honestly just conquer any monster and then that's just a lot less interesting. I made a video about this at the beginning of the year, but Matt is trying to make sure that the city feels real and plausible, so yeah, the Slayer's Take can't help solve every problem. They're not high enough level. Especially since, as Vanessa says, the party really needs to go talk to the temples, because those are the real centers of power in the city. But first, Vox Machina goes beneath the Slayer's Take Guildhall to the underground ziggurat platform to speak with Osisa, the Sphinx patron of the Slayer's Take. And Osisa has some ideas about how she can help. As her muscles tense, her eyes open again, that color flashing with this kind of uh, luminescent blue color, and her voice falls even deeper into her register and almost has this monotone, informative projection that says, the vestiges of divergence. Relics wielded when the gods walked and fought alongside their creations. The light fades from the eyes for a second and she catches herself and steps back. May I ask, what are the vestiges of divergence? Yes. She kind of shakes her head. I am a channel for this knowledge, but best I can understand, they are Old relics of the War of the Divergence. Leading into the Penance, the Second Spark. These were armaments, objects of great power that were used in these wars against the gods, good and dark. Many have been buried, entombed, lost, forgotten. The few that are recovered have passed on through bloodlines, through 
symbols of power and of seats of great political importance. But the actual information is lost to me. And now the second half of the Chroma Conclave arc begins to take shape. They don't just have dragons to kill, they have relics to find. But also, Matt did something really smart here. He limits Osisa's knowledge, but not to what she might have encountered or heard about or read about. Her knowledge is limitless thanks to her goddess, Ayun, granting her the power of prophecy. She's an oracle. She can give out any information Matt wants to reveal. And if there's anything that Matt doesn't want to say yet, then Matt can hold that back as well by saying, oh, I don't know, the vision didn't give me that detail. It's such a smart way to control the flow of information in a very exposition-heavy scene, especially when the party is consulting with someone who is supposedly incredibly knowledgeable. Do you know of anyone in particular? Not within my field of vision. Objects of this pow powerful enchantment are also prone to want to keep themselves hidden. Oh, Caesar. If you are aware of this knowledge, then you know that Vasselheim is one of the only remaining cities still left standing. Are there any other services you can offer to help us fight this? The danger that you run here is that Vasselheim has stood the test of time and survived two possible ends of civilization as we know it. But it has survived both of these events because those who guard it stayed to guard it. You may be hard pressed to convince others to step beyond the walls knowing that such a danger could use that to their advantage and destroy the greatest city that we know of. You are welcome to ask, but it will be a difficult journey. This is a fantastic answer that actually lines up with what we've been discussing on this channel ever since the Chroma Conclave arc began. Matt is making sure that there is no one single faction or force that is going to dedicate a ton of resources to helping Vox Machina, for lots of different reasons. Emon and Westron obviously just got ravaged by dragons. Whitestone has nothing to offer since they're currently recovering from the Briarwood occupation. Syngorn fucked off to the Feywild, carrying half of Amon's army with them. I actually have no idea how much of the army they took, but the uh, Amon military leader did go with them, so even if any other major military leaders survived the attack, it's gonna be really hard for them to rally all the military together. Marquette is a big question mark to the south, uh, but Vasselheim is a city that has never fallen to any invasion. How do they do it? Well, by not getting involved. And it's a reasonable point. If they dedicate too many resources, it leaves Vasselheim open to some of their ancient enemies. I mean, Vox Machina still plans to talk to the major temples, but Matt is maybe actually preparing them for the strong possibility that the answer is going to be no. What I can offer, though. My mate is a keeper of much hidden knowledge over on his side of Tal'Dore. I may be able to send you to him to seek this information. Okay, so Osisa has a mate who might have more information about the vestiges back on the continent of Tal'Dore. And here, Matt is offering a doorway to how they can continue this leg of the journey. It's not enough just to say, vestiges exist, good luck. The party needs some place to start looking. You provide a service with the Slayer's take to Vasselheim. Do you have any interest in spreading that influence to Iman if we can save it? What an interesting offer. This is almost exactly the same deal that the Clasp wanted, and here Vax is offering it freely. Of course, he just trusts the Slayer's take more, and specifically, he feels that Osisa is trustworthy. If we were to lend our power to you, I would ask that you prove yourselves the ones that could carry this torch. How so? Perhaps find these relics. Gather other allies. Prove to me that I would not be sending my people to their doom. Then return. Perhaps then, when you think you are ready, we could lend our guild to your service. So they've got their mandate. If they want more help from Osisa and from the Slayer's Take, they should go and find the vestiges and then return here to demonstrate that they were able to accomplish this task. While they're speaking with Osisa, Vex asked about Vecna. Osisa has an almost violent reaction to the name. He's an ancient enemy of Ayun. I also want to highlight how Vex has been the one who has been keen to know more about Vecna ever since the end of the Briarwood arc. Uh, she took Gilmore aside for the same thing as well back in episode 38. 
I just think it's interesting because ultimately, slight spoilers here, but the end of the Chroma Conclave arc is not the end of the campaign. When the Conclave arc eventually ends, Matt was considering whether or not they would end the campaign there or keep it going. He wound up leaving that choice up to the players. But with Laura asking all these questions about Vecna, who is not a major part of the Chroma Conclave arc, Matt is sort of already getting the same answer he's going to get a year later. The cast, or at least Laura right now, feels like there hasn't been any closure about Vecna. As they discuss the topic, Vax is hoping that their openness here with the cultists that they've experienced and the evil plans in Whitestone can help demonstrate some goodwill, and perhaps coax Osisa to grant them a little bit more help. Dark creatures attempted to, as best that we can surmise, open a gate beneath the castle of Whitestone. Whitestone. And she steps back for a second. Her eyes flare up with energy again, and you can see the hearthstone embedded in the floor of the stone glow even brighter and brighter as she puts her paws on the side and peers into it. She begins to mutter beneath her breath. I can see the snowy north of Taldore. The castle. Beneath. One of our corrupted temples, forgotten long ago. One of your temples? The cigarettes were not of his construction. But he took them. But of course, Vecna is not really the topic of today's discussion. So after Matt drops that bit of exposition about how the ziggurat belonged to Ayun back in the day, he moves the topic back to the Chroma Conclave, and once again, establishes another potential ally who will not be able to help. Mm -hmm eyes kind of wince for a moment. Those who took him on, they draw my gaze. Something is happening. Right now? What do you see? The this... path to Western, eastward. What's east of Western? It was a map. Part smoldering and left behind, the path continues over the Lucidian Ocean. Eastward, beyond the shores of Wildmount. Her head looks up, still staring off into the distance. Into the Dreamoth Ravine. I see the floating islands of Draconia falling. <gasps> crumbling. Damn. There is. Gone. An army sundered. People ruined. The Conclave sated returns towards your land once more. So the dragons flew east to Wildmount and leveled Draconia. It's gone. Now a couple things to discuss here. First, in a post-Campaign 2 world, we know that there are a ton of other cities in Wildmount. Why didn't the dragons attack those? Well, there are two reasons, and they're both valid. The first is that, as we will go on to see in the next campaign, uh, none of the other cities in Wildmount are as high magic as Amon. Tadori is a more high fantasy setting, whereas Wildmount has a bit more grit to it. So most of those cities just don't have the same ubiquitous magic items, and the magic users are all tied up in internal politics and a simmering cold war. That's not to say that they don't have any magic item shops. They do, just like Draconia or Amon. But from the perspective of the dragons, the Wildmount cities are probably just less of a threat. But from all the stories we've heard of Draconia, they were a danger to the dragons. They were a very magic-centric civilization. They had wyvern riders and floating islands. And we know from the sorcerer Tiberius and his warlock brother that there are multiple magic users in the noble family. But of course, that's my post-campaign 2 rationalization. That's my no-prize explanation. The real reason is that the cast didn't know anything about Wildmount at the time. And because this story is about Vox Machina's characters, the attacks are limited to places Vox Machina cares about. There are plenty of other potential strategic targets the dragons could have hit. They could have wiped out a bunch of cities in Wildmount that the party had never heard of. They could have poured acid and poison into the tunnels of Craghammer. They could have gone south to Ankarel, to the first city that ever rebuffed Thordak's invasion. Hell, despite the claims of Vasselheim, the four dragons probably could have given them a run for their money, and Vasselheim is, inarguably, much closer to the portal Thordak escaped from. But what cities did the dragons actually attack? Emon, where Vox Machina lives, Westron, where half the pre-stream games took place, and Draconia, where one of their former player characters was from, and where he was returning to. And of course, that brings us to another major factor. The party could have gone to Draconia for support, because their very good buddy Tiberius just moved back home. Despite their uh, separation from the player, the character had already made an appearance as an NPC under Matt's control. And even if Tiberius wasn't in town, even if he was just off-screen the entire time, Draconia could still make a powerful ally. None of them had suggested going to Draconia, but it was still an option. 
but now it's gone. And of course, the party has no idea what that means for Tiberius himself. Anyway, they've gotten a lot of information out of Osisa. They know that they need to go find some relics, they know they, know they need to go find a sphinx who can help them find those relics, and they know that Draconia just got destroyed. So Matt decides that it is time to close the door on some of Osisa's omniscience, at least for the time being. You can see blood pouring out of one of her nostrils now. I peered too far beyond the veil that contains me. I'm sorry, my... <clears throat> she plops down and is kind of breathing a little heavy. Return when you've proven yourself. We shall. And you think this conclave <clears throat> could possibly be felt beneath your weapons and might and will. So yeah, good meeting everyone. And now the question arises, what are Zara and Cash going to do? I cannot let this go. You know I cannot cash. Z, this is fucking happy fun bunch over here. <laughs> no. I mean, they bring death with them everywhere they go. This isn't our fight. Not mm. all of them. <clears throat> Vanessa agrees to supply them with some healing potions, and then they head out into the quad roads to go buy more. Along the way, Vax and Vex have their first ever heart-to-heart -heart about his feelings for Keyleth. Kind of. Is it kind of weird that he's here? He's useful. And I don't hold anything against him, and she's... Why wouldn't he want her? Of course he does. Yes, 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 you is so fucking beautiful, I get it. <laughs> well, so are you, but what the fuck am I gonna do with that? <laughs> Jeez, you're fucking weird. And I walk off. Okay. <laughs> Grog meets up with the potion vendor and begins to haggle, despite the protestations of the rest of the party. My sister is very good at... Do you know what math is? Mathis? <laughs> Vex negotiates by giving the vendor some random ass trinkets, and then half the cast uses cantrips to make them seem magical. When that only knocks the price down to 6,000 gold, they move on to full on intimidation. Breezing through this, they get a bunch of potions, and then the vendor asks to never see them again. And then they go to buy some black powder. Now I'm going to put the time codes on screen. The full scene is fantastic, but let's talk about the lessons we can learn from the return of Victor the Black Powder Merchant. I actually think this may be my favorite of the Victor scenes. I mean, they're all fun, and it's very difficult to compete with the manic energy of the first, but this one gets the closest to capturing that vibe. Although part of that, I think, comes from the wave of relief felt by the cast. They've experienced weeks of anguish in this campaign, and now they at least have a moment of pure, zany joy. That being said, there are some lessons right away. The first is... Victor has changed. As you approach the same area, you can see that the building, uh, you know, same as it was before, other than it's missing half a roof. <laughs> You're looking well. <laughs> Mostly. And you turn around and you can see now, what you, did, what you failed to notice when you first noticed is that uh, where once there was five, there is now three fingers. Yes! Oh, <laughs> yes. No, he has character progression. <laughs> And he was wearing reading glasses to show that time had passed. Now this makes perfect sense, especially for someone as wild as Victor. There's no chance that the entire Briarwood arc could have occurred, and Victor would be in exactly the same state as he was before. He's not a very static character. But this is honestly something that I struggle with when players return to interact with a lot of my NPCs. Not only do I not put enough thought into how they might have changed, but often they're just in the exact same place I originally predicted the party would encounter them in my very first notes. Did I first write down that someone is in a tavern sitting at the corner table? Well, that's usually where he'll be when I don't think about it any deeper before the players go back there. When that happens, a lot of my characters fail to be living creatures in a detailed world. They just become World of Warcraft NPCs. I assume. I didn't play a lot of WoW. I was a City of Heroes kid myself. So here's our first lesson. When you know your players are going to interact with someone again, take the time to think about what they've been through since the last time the players crossed paths with the NPC. Where would they be? What have they done? How have they changed? It helps your game worlds feel a lot more nuanced. Also, I think it's noticeable that Matt laughs before he delivers the details that Victor's roof is busted or that his fingers are gone. And that brings us to our next lesson, which is a funny one. Literally. This time around, Matt is aware that Victor is a funny character, so he's putting the things in the scenes that he thinks are funny. Can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Percival. Do you remember me? No! <laughs> And he whips around with this uh, this kind of metallic cylinder that is like very well sealed. And he's like, I learned from my mistakes. That's very impressive. Oh. And he walks very carefully, like very gingerly placing it on the table. Oh, okay. Carefully. 
He pulls out <laughs> like a small <laughs> torch. Have to unseal the metal. Let's not do that. <laughs> it's coffee. <laughs> 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 I'm curious. I'm curious. How, how have your own experiments been going? Going well? Been uh, yeah. <laughs> this is tricky to get right. I'm probably going to do videos at some point in the future about comedy in D and D and how it can be hard to join in on jokes as a GM, depending on the tone of your campaign. But here, Victor is kind of Matt's outlet to do goofier material. Most of the rest of the time, the comedy comes from Matt's deadpan reactions to the antics of his players, or from an NPC just having a funny pattern of speech, like the Matt Maker's squeaky voice and entertaining facial expressions. But here, Matt allows himself to be as ridiculous as he wants. That being said, Matt also knows that a return visit to Victor isn't going to be satisfying if all he does is deliver the same jokes in a different form. So Matt does what he does best. He uses this moment to hand out some important exposition. Wait! I do know you. Yes. You've purchased before. I have. Return customer. Not many of those. <laughs> Not many. Have there been others? <laughs> he pours a couple of cups for you, pulls it over to you. Uh, uh, one. Don't uh, drink it. Months ago. Really? Who Who would? Nice woman. Uh, long, uh, good outfit, well-dressed. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, you, she didn't happen to say where she was going, did she, by any chance? No, no. Weeks, not months. Time, strange. Weeks. Very good to know. So Ripley bought black powder from Victor. That's good to know. But of course, she could have done that before the party met her in Whitestone. And if she visited months ago, then that would be the case. But that's where it seems like Matt realizes that he made a mistake. It was months ago in the real world that Ripley got away, but not that long ago in the world of the game. And his intent was to demonstrate that she had gone to Victor after leaving Whitestone. So he has Victor amend it. She didn't visit months ago, but only weeks ago. After all, not only does that work better with what Victor said in his first appearance, that no one asks about the black powder, which would not be true if Ripley had already visited him a few months earlier, but also this makes it clear that Ripley is still running around. She's not only at large, but she's back on her bullshit, trying to develop guns. As we see from her apparent visit to Victor's shop, she is literally following in Percy's footsteps. Also, at the end of the scene, Victor develops a crush on Vex that is really funny, so for real, go watch the full scene. Percy and the twins meet up with the rest of the group, and everyone else is already truly drunk. Kern the Hammer enters the bar, sees Grog, and turns and runs, and Grog chases him, but not to fight, just to talk. Because Kern actually knows Earthbreaker Groon. Groon trained Kern a little bit, so we can tell Grog a little bit about him. What's funny is, Groon trained Kern on the condition that, one day, Kern would test someone for Groon. And Kern is still kind of waiting for the call. When is he going to test somebody for Groon? And neither Kern nor Grog realize that he already did. He tested Grog in the Trial Forge. Anyway, Grog and Kern are on good enough terms. But then, well, you might remember the fan-made gift Travis received with his participation trophy from Kern? They're going to get a little bit more mileage out of it. The medal was a joke. I think there was... <laughs> I was in a sore place. Literally, a very, very sore place. Uh-huh. Um, I wanted to apologize for that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I should go. I'm gonna. And he starts walking past you out into the main street. Kern, poured strength to you, my friend. He doesn't even look back. He goes, uh, You too. And he just keeps walking. <laughs> <laughs> the cast describes themselves as being wildly drunk. Vax accidentally locks himself in a closet. But honestly, I think this is just the cast enjoying the break from the misery. But they want to be sober before they see Kima, and some of the cast really wants to go recruit Kima now. So Matt winds the clock forward a few hours and describes how some coffee clears their heads. They go to the Platinum Sanctuary, the Temple of Bahamut, and are met not by Kima, but by High Bearer Vord. Vord had a dream where he witnessed these attacks in Amon, but their divine connection has confirmed that the Dragon Queen Tiamat is not involved, so neither is the Temple of Bahamut. These dragons haven't menaced Vasselheim, and if any of the members of their army leave, that might be when someone like Tiamat would strike. So it's not their problem. But he will lend the assistance of their greatest champion. And he kind of steps aside and puts his hand out, and one of the armored knights steps forward. <laughs> Full armored, this um, this tall, kind of uh, wide-chested, masculine form. You can't see the face as the helmet kind of protects it, but shield comes out <laughs> and slams the ground and goes to kneel on one knee. And he says, your charge, Platinum Knight Udaya. Udaya? One of our finest warriors. 
Boom has had time and time again, at which point you hear a loud <coughs> sound as all of a sudden Udair is thrown off of his feet, his shield kind of bent in and skidding across the ground. You see stepping up behind uh, a female halfling, scar across the face, yeah. and gold trimmed armor, a blue cloak behind her, shouting out, Oh no you don't, this is my home turf! I'm going! <laughs> Yeah, Kima! I'll take that Ooh, one. <laughs> we want that one. Vord reluctantly agrees to allow Lady Kima to go with the party. They ask about the vestiges of Divergence, and he doesn't know where any of them are, but he knows that they won't be the only ones searching for them. There are always some folks who are just out looking for the items of power, either because they plan to use them to gather money, or to gather power. He confirms the locations of vestiges might be in old tomes, but he doesn't have any of those here at the temple. When prompted for more info, Vord launches into a history of the creation myth of Exandria. Time code is on the screen, but in the years since, they've also made a video about the history of Exandria. It's in the description. We'll talk about the vestiges some more when they actually begin making appearances in the game, but I do like that there's nothing in the lore that dictates how many vestiges exist. There can be as many or as few as you want if you're running a game set in Exandria. The party leaves the temple, and Cash tells Keyleth that he's very happy about their kiss, but he apologizes for stealing it. And that's a great lesson, which we've discussed before. It's better to make sure someone knows you're going to kiss them, because then everyone is on the same page. And it's sexy. Anticipation is sexy, much more so than surprise. They arrive at the Trial Forge to meet with Earthbreaker Groon, who is meditating in the sand pit. But Groon knows Grog can easily be tempted by power. Case in point, Craven Edge. And Groon wants to test him to see if his willpower is strong. He asks Grog, where do you find your strength? Then he starts beating him up while repeating the question. He then asks who Grog wants to join him in the pit. Grog answers Pike, which is very sweet, but since she's not here, she's not available. So he recruits Vax and Scanlan. And it's initiative, so here are the highlights. Vax hides behind Grog and starts launching daggers at Groon, and I think about this moment once a month. Okay, so I'm hidden behind Grog, so it should be sneak attack, and I'm the first to go, so it's a crit. Uh, you're the first to go, it is a crit. It is not a sneak attack. Not a sneak attack, even though I use my bonus to hide behind Grog's big fat leg. Where could you possibly be, Vax? He's huge! <laughs> Where could you right. have possibly okay. hidden from his sight in the middle of this giant open sandy arena? I He's am... disappeared! Scanlan puts Groon to sleep with magic and then inspires Grog by singing a Grog centric version of the fight song for the, at the time, unfortunately racistly named Washington football team, just because Sam is trolling Travis. I don't think Sam's a football fan at all, but he knows that Travis is. They stab the hell out of Kern, which wakes him up, but he takes a lot of damage. Groon hits Vax with Quivering Palm, but Vax makes the save, so he does not take 10d10 necrotic damage. This fight is like a commercial for monks. The cast is losing their shit at everything that Groon can do. But he also has legendary resistances and legendary actions, so there's some homebrew here too. He's not just a normal monk. Grog plants Craven Edge in the sand and draws the Flaming Warhammer, but then he just needs to make a wisdom saving throw, and he fails. And so, of course, he can't give up Craven Edge, the weapon that's screaming and begging him to draw more blood. That's a good sword! Gotta use that sword that's begging him to murder more people. Everything's fine, it's a good sword. Groon shrouds Grog's vision in darkness and asks again, where do you find your strength? And Grog answers, in my friends. And the fight is over. That's the answer Groon was looking for. Groon tells them that they do not need Vasselheim's strength. So, it's another no to committing their armed forces to leave the city. But he knows what they're looking for, and so he gives them the details of two vestiges he's heard of. And watch Travis's reaction to this. I know of two. The rest you must find yourself. A gift from Cord himself to this mortal plane, carved from the corpse of the Earth primordial Titan that fell on this continent in the first war. These Titan stone knuckles were a symbol of power and leadership for generations here in Vasselheim, until the last known keeper was slain 200 years ago. The gauntlet's taken. I know not of the whereabouts. Why did Travis react like that? Because he came up with the Titan stone knuckles. They're part of his backstory. He created that name. And we'll come back to those specific items later in the campaign when they become relevant, but I made a video about Matt's style of GMing, where you take the backgrounds your players give you, and then you filter through them for adventures and NPCs. But what was the other vestige that Gruen has heard of? The other. Leathers adorned by the champion of the Raven Queen. This champion's tomb has since come to ruin, sunken beneath a lake to the west of here, known as the Marrowglade Lock. Within that tomb lies the Deathwalker's ward. Now go. You found your strength. 
You know your path. I can help you no further. Okay, so now they've got a goal. Something to do next that's not too far from here. Keyleth gives the beaten up Vax a quick kiss on the cheek. And then since Vax was still day drunk and had just had the stuffing beaten out of him, Liam describes Vax throwing up. And Matt has Keyleth roll a deck save, but she's good. She dodges out of the splash zone. That's the end of the episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back in two weeks with episode 44, The Sunken Tomb. This episode, oh boy, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Come back for that one for sure. In the meantime, subscribe for more fun videos. Support me on Patreon if you want and if you're able. Join my Discord to hang out with other fun folks. Follow me on Twitch to catch my live streams and sign up for my newsletter if that's a thing you'd like to see. Throughout this video, I made multiple references to my video about taking away the hero's support structures, so make sure to check that video out here if you haven't seen it already. Until next time, play fair and have fun. <laughs> we just had a third party perspective. Yeah, I mean, she gave us a lot to sphinx about, so we, we just. Um. <laughs> Wow. Uh. wow. <laughs>